Um, and I like to, you know, cater this as much as possible to like who's here and what's going on. So um, I'll do like a little hand raise thing so, so I can understand. And then also let me know like, we'll save questions for the end, but if you say generally things you're interested in now, like feel free to like yell it out to me and I'll either make, make a mental note to get to it if it's already in the talk or get back to it at the end of the talk. Um, but anyway, like who here works for someone else's company? Like raise your hand if you are an employee at another company. Okay, cool. And then, okay, raise your hand if you're like an independent freelancer, like working alone. Okay, cool, that's good, that's kind of target. Um, are you like a freelancer working in a team? So maybe you have a partner or like a small team or like an agency or something? Um, okay, so is there anyone here who already has products and is focused like on products as part of their consulting? All right, cool. And then like, is there anyone here who hasn't raised their hand for some reason? <laughs> okay, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, I appreciate that. And then, again, um, if uh, like save questions for the end, but like if there's a general topic or like a slide or something on your mind that you could state in one sentence, you want you want to make sure I get a hold of. Anyone have anything on your mind? Existing membership. Memberships. Okay. All right. I'll think of that. That's kind of a component. Um, cool. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm Jason Coleman. Uh, I've been working on WordPress like almost since the beginning, sometime 2005, it was version 1.5. Uh, and um, I'm also CEO of Paid Memberships Pro. It's a membership plugin for WordPress. Uh, and that's the product that this uh, presentation mostly covers like us from moving from a consulting company focused on membership sites to developing that as a product and selling it. Um, recently, I also invested in Lifter LMS and work as the CTO there, helping them grow their team and get things done. So that's also like a WordPress product. Uh, doing uh, learning management systems, courseware type stuff. Um, and I'm also like the co-author of an O'Reilly book <laughs> called Building a Web Ass with WordPress. I got a copy of the book, I got to like, you know, it's not part of any contract thing. I'm like, the book, the book. Um, and I have copies, ask me if you're interested in this. Um, but it's a, you know, a book for developers of WordPress, learning how to build apps, like or maybe like if you were trying to learn how to program, like you know WordPress very well, learn programming, or if you're a programmer and you want to learn how WordPress works, it's kind of the audience for that book. Um, and that's, you know, tw uh, Twitter DMs for now is a decent way to contact me, <laughs> um, or Slack, through like the WordPress.org Slack if you want to follow up. Um, look for Jason Coleman in the WordPress Slack. Um, just so you know, like where I'm coming from. Yeah, and then another thing is like, I may say we or us, like for the, you know, this is kind of a cutesy slide, but, uh, and we just had our 16-year uh, wedding anniversary yesterday. I was like, I'm busy with WordCamp for our wedding anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> we celebrated earlier. Um, but Kim and I, we're like 50-50 team. Like, uh, you'll see in the timeline, like, we've always been working together. We're practically one person. And when I say we or us, like, usually I'm, I'm talking about, you know, Kim and I working on things together. So it's good that you know that she's a really good developer, designer, operator, um, and, like, you know, huge part of the business. And... Um, yeah, I think the next slide is uh, Paymasters Pro. But I'll say, you know, like, we've grown, like, the end of this presentation is kind of like when we launched the product, and since then we've grown to a team of, like, 15. So us is, you know, Sam is in the room, and some other folks, Kim is, another Kim is here. Um, <clears throat> so it's a bigger us, but the presentation really focuses when it was mostly just Kim and I, and we had, like, a couple contractors. Um, and we're focused on Paymasters Pro, and so, like, to make it clear what that is, it's a membership plugin. It's powering somewhere around 120,000 you know websites to, for them to charge access to their content. Um, about 6,000 of those people pay for additional services on our site, and that's how we make money for support, training, updates. And then, like I said, we have like about 15 people, 12 full time, and three part time people working on just that project now. Um, and the cross outs there, I did this presentation in like 2017, so that's like it was 60,000 back then and 3,000 paying members. So we've we've kind of uh, you know, doubled the user base and kind of quadrupled like the team size and the revenue size for the company. Um, and so you know, you know the, the background on that. And I kind of hope like it's like a, you know I'm going to tell my story. There's lots of paths to transitioning from consulting to products or what do you want to do. But I'm focused on like sharing my story as an example, and maybe you could have some takeaways. And you know, hopefully, that could be like a, an example for folks being like, hey, this is possible to do to grow a business and have you know successful business and life from it. Um, all right, so this is a timeline. I feel like my watercolor thing is like on the wrinkly screen is like losing <laughs> fidelity, it's okay. Um, 
So quick timeline of like my personal career, and then like I said, Kim, us and I, like in uh, 2004, I graduated from college. I worked at Accenture for a couple years doing like business consulting, like pro SAP project planning. It was a little boring for me. Um, and then when Kim graduated in 2006, she was doing freelance graphic design and web design, and I was helping out. And so that's when I was like, hey, uh, I took a sabbatical um, and said, hey, maybe we can start a business together. And it worked out, and I didn't have to go back to corporate life. And so these are kind of like the transitions of, of you know my career path with Kim is like we were just like freelance dev, which was um, I'll, I'll go, I guess I'll go into all of these a little bit more on the next slides. Uh, but you know as we worked from freelance, then we focused on WordPress, uh, then we like focused on e-commerce and WordPress, and then sometimes around 2011, we were focused on membership sites, and that's really when we hey we built this for clients, and then we like hey let's give it to everyone else. Um, and then from 2001 to 2014, we had the product, but primarily the consulting company was bringing home the money for us. Um, and then 2015, 16, we transitioned to like fully products. Um, so yeah, the, like I said, this is my story and my timeline. Like it doesn't have to be this long. You could probably skip some steps. Um, you could probably go a little faster. I also like had kids and like bought a house and you know like uh, <laughs> lived a life in there. So you know, it was a very much a. A good this, you know, good life and business. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So freelancing, this is around 2006, uh, and the goal then was, you know, to, to make a living, like just like just get paid for de developing work. Um, it also for me, like coming from the corporate world, was I was excited that like I could own the project. So like you build something for like the big demand, the big company, and then they're like, that's really cool. You did that well. Like, will you do that? Like over and over and over again every week for, for like the next 10 years of your life, the same exact thing and give it to me. Um, so it's like, it's cool to like build projects and own things. Um, and so I think if you're thinking about products and you're doing consulting, like that freelancing stage for me was really important because I learned like tons of skills that are still useful now, like, you know, the seeds of them. So like how to create a company, like an LLC in the United States pass through, how to file business taxes, how to be your own boss. And again, remember Kim, this is like Kim and I, Kim does a lot of the tax stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how to be your own boss, how to manage your time. I remember that first month when I left Accenture, there was a lot of like World of Warcraft had just been released, like that online game. And so like, I luckily didn't get addicted to it, but I was really into it for like a month. And I was like, this is scary. I mean, we watched like every Sopranos episode. Like, and so there was like, not so much, you know, it was like, oh yeah, I guess we're supposed to be working now. Um, so it was really like managing your own time. Like it took a while for us to learn that. Um, we learned how to sell ourselves. So you had to get up in front of someone and like tell them like, you should give me money for this thing I'm gonna give you. It's like, it's, it's a skill. It's not, it doesn't come natural to people. Uh, how to like create a business plan and like work towards business goals. We learned about, we learned about raising money and that we didn't want to do that. You can ask me about this, but we, we were throwing projects on the wall, you know, like building kind of apps. And one of them was a wine, a social network for wine drinkers called Wine Loft, which is shut down now, but it got crazy popular, 50,000 people and VCs wanted to invest. And so we were entertaining, you know, offers to, to work on that. And I'm, I'm, I'm super transparent. So it was kind of like, I was like, you're giving $2 million. And then I was like, I was like, I was like, but I can't make $2 million with this website. Like it doesn't actually work. Like we can't make money this way. I was like way too honest. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, this is weird. Like, I, let's like, I like like uh, bootstrapping. So I learned like, hey, I don't want to do that path of raising money. I want to bootstrap. Um, and we honed our marketing skills, programming skills, design skills. We built like a whole social network from scratch, and like we used that to learn about you know e-commerce and stuff. Um, so the next stage, I said like we were freelancing, and then we became like consultants, right? Um, so like at some point, like in the early days, it was like any project we would take and it's like, you're going to give me money to program something. Cool. I'll let you know. That's the work. And you start to focus a little bit. Um, and our goal during this phase was really like to grow. So like we had figured out like the mechanics and I was like, can I get paid like more? Can I increase my hourly rate? And what is that like? Um, <clears throat> and for me, the main difference between like freelancing and consulting in my mind is that like a freelancer is getting paid to do one thing. Like that's the thing that they're doing. They're getting paid for. And the consultant is really working with the clients to figure out what they're supposed to do in the first place. Um, and there is like a friction there where like, you know, as we got more knowledgeable about things and it's kind of like, hey, will you program this? And it's like, it's kind of a bad idea. Maybe you should do it this way. Or like, you know, um, you know, you guys probably deal with this, the freelancers of put a slider on the homepage. And it's like, what, like, what do you want your website to do? Like, I want people to call me. So I can someone's like, put your phone number at the top really big. <laughs> it's like, people will call you, but that's ugly. It's like, who cares? Like, you want people to call you, right? So it's kind of that level thing of like, you know, expanding your knowledge. Um, 
But at the same time, you were learning from customers, so getting close to them and learning like the different businesses and industries and how they work. Um, like it's not a true date unless you go to more than one place. <laughs> and so it was like, it would give you like a plan. It's like, you're gonna get a drink here and then you're gonna go to this restaurant, then you're gonna walk in the park and it like would plan out your date for you. Uh, and we built this really cool tool to do that and like they couldn't market it or get people to use it and stuff. But it was all brand new from scratch. No one had ever done it before. You know, we built the wine website on our side. Uh, we helped someone build like a, it seems like Instagram. I wish I could remember the name of the, the company, but it was like before smartphones and stuff. So it was just on like old, you know, WAP phones, WAP phones, but I'd upload a picture and put stickers on it and stuff. Um, and it, I think a startup didn't work, but he held a patent that he sold to Instagram and made a bunch of money. And like, so he, he did all right. But like the stuff we built for them, you know, it was every time it was like from scratch. Anyway, so if you niche down, you're like, hey, I'm building membership sites for associations. And you're like, so easy to sell to a customer because you're like, that site I built for him, oh, I'll build it for you now. Like the same exact site, just different colors and your logo and your customers. Um, so it's way easy to sell. You, you can do it quicker because you're like, I already did this and it takes me half the time, but I don't have to charge by the hour and only get paid half the money, like get paid the full price, you're basically <laughs> doubling your rate. Um, so we were learning these things about consulting that you can ask me questions about. <clears throat> um, so what else? Free products. All right, we're getting towards products. And the transition, again, in our life, this was around like 2011 or so. Um, you know, the, the folks who freelance and consult, you find like you'll make custom plugins for your clients. And it's like, hey, this is really cool. Like other people could use this. And so we had stuff like that. And I recommend kind of like spending some time, it is time to generalize it, uh, but spending some time to generalize it so you, you can give it away for free and kind of get exposure. Uh, for building things and get feedback from folks. And real quick on that point of like the time it takes, like I think the rule of thumb is like if you build something for one client, it might take you at least twice as long, maybe five times as long to generalize it for everyone. I remember at a WordCamp um, back at back then, I was building Paid Memberships Pro. And I was like, cool, we got four clients using this. And I'm gonna launch next month. You know, and I think it was like a year later at least. I came back to like I think that same work camp. I was like, remember I said I was going to launch that then, but now it's ready. It took a year, crazy. Um, and so there's tons of stuff when you generalize it. Like it's specific for that site. It's maybe like the settings are in a PHP file and a programmer does it, but now you have to build a user interface for it. It has to work at these times for like blocks and at Elementor and Divi and. If they're using this other plugin for this, it breaks. This theme does this, it breaks. If they're on this kind of a host, it's not going to work anymore. And so, you know, finding out and, and handling all these edge cases, you know, making it user friendly and easy to set up takes time. And so, but I think it's worth it because when you have a free product, <clears throat> um, you you get attention. Like for us, it was a membership plugin. And it was like, oh, those are the guys who make the membership plugin. I'll hire them to build my membership site. So it's like if you have like a marketing plugin, it's like, oh, they built a plugin for marketing. They must know marketing. I'll hire them to do marketing type stuff. If you, you know, so it's like this is a way to get people and it's free, so it's easy to access. Like you'll get the most users. Like at this point, in, like we just wanted people using it and getting feedback and learning how to make this better. Uh, so focusing on free helps for that. And and this advice is true like for software products like plugins, but also like books and videos and courses and other things that you might sell. Like create a free version and put it out there and get like users first and go through the process of like figuring out how that works. Like getting, not customers yet because they're not paying you, but like users for your product, um, you know, helps you figure that out. And I think the good advice that I didn't take is like to keep it simple. Like we built like a membership platform that does a hundred different things. And it's like, I wish like the early products, like we had a couple that were kind of doing something more simple. Um, yes, yeah, so we built cloud exposure for the business, you know, recognition at work camps and things like that. Um, and it, it helped us like, uh, we were getting paid to implement that. So the, pro the plugin was free and then people would pay us thousands of dollars to set it up on their website, you know. Um, <clears throat> I also think about um, open source is a good way to go if you're building especially software products, but also you can open source music and courses and content and things like that. Um, and because we're in the WordPress space and WordPress itself is open source, it's, it's really good to go along with like the community uh, is comfortable with that, kind of expects that um, and helps to get, um, you know, a lot of exposure. And yeah, quick point, like the W doesn't touch the end, which is like not 
kosher for the WordPress logo, but I, I built this in stable. All these images are stable diffusion generated. That's like a new AI that does images, and that's its version of the WordPress logo. And I was like, oh, I was like, I should fix it. And I was like, I'll keep it. And I was like, some, I don't know if someone like from the, the community is going to be like, hey, that's not the official logo. Um, <clears throat> be careful. Um, but yeah, so WordPress itself is open source and product, and I think this is changing somewhat. Like, I'm open to talking about that. It came up early. It's like, what's changing in WordPress or what's challenging in WordPress, what's happening, and it's kind of, as like, businesses are growing and, um, you know, profit, like uh, public companies that are, have a mandate to make as much money as possible are like integrating with smaller indie companies to figure out how WordPress works. Like it's, it's kind of the open sourceness of WordPress is, there's friction there. It's not like obvious to everyone. Um, but open source does force you to like share your product as wide as possible, which again is like, was kind of like the point of my mindset at this, is getting as many people to use it and engage with it as possible. People were building on top of our software, they were incorporating it in other ways, and that's hard to get without doing open source. Um, so charging, I, actually almost every slide I could do a whole talk on. Charging I could do like a whole talk on. Um, but uh, yeah, what are my points here? So, you know, going from free to charge, was, hey, we had a free product, it was getting used, and then we started to charge. Like, I think a, a really important point I wanna push out here is, um, maybe it's counter to the like start free advice, but I think people get stuck on free, and then they feel like, I can't charge. Cause I, you know, it doesn't it doesn't do enough. Or I need like a, a free version and a premium version with different features, and I can't figure out like which features should go where. Or I feel like I should have like three plans. Or it'd be easier if it was a service, and I was marketing. And they're thinking of like kind of like these technical issues. Um, and I feel like one of the the best starting points is like if you have a free product, people need support for it. It's like just put a price tag and charge basically your hourly rate to do support for that. You know. Do the math. If like a typical support customer takes me like, you know, an hour of time and it's ninety seven dollars a year, that if you're charging ninety seven dollars an hour for your consulting, it's like you know, and do the math and just get it out there, charge for support, and and again, this is in the spirit of like going through the, going through the process of charging for a product and having customers and dealing with them before you kind of complicate it too much. So I think keeping it simple here, we definitely did of trying to have one product, one price point, as simple as possible. Um, and it, it wasn't like, we didn't transition yet, we were making some money, it was every time we worked on paid memberships pro, it was like we made less than we would if we were like consulting for folks, you know, we were charging like $300 an hour for consulting, and like $97 a year for support that might take a few hours, you know, for people. Um, but, so, you know, just to say like how we did the version of PM Pro and the repository was the same as the one we sold through our site. Um, part of that free um, a little infection, but we felt there's an opportunity to like charge for more, you know, and focus on products. We were, we were like a little tired of like consulting. It's like getting up at midnight to push a site live so it goes down after, you know, people calling us and expecting it on vacation and be like, you gotta fix this now. And they're like, do I really? I guess, um, you know, uh, it felt tough and we were like, oh, like I like the product customers. Like, let's get more of those and, um, you know, leave consulting. Uh, but it was hard because we were making really good money from consulting, like maybe, you know, we were making at the time, you know, like twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 a month on consulting and to spend the time that we needed to to focus on the product. So we felt we had to spend the time. It wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't getting our full attention and it, it needed a boost. If we, and, it, and when you're making $30,000 a month consulting and at the time maybe like $3,000 a month selling support plans, when push comes to shove, it's like, oh, I'm gonna you know, do the work for the, the client so I can get paid and, and make money. Um, and so we really like, you know, there's that tension where like, you can get stuck where you're like, I can't push the product over because I don't have enough time. And, and even more than time, it's like the headspace because nothing's easy, it's challenging. And the first thing you try like doesn't work and you have to kind of try again and reiterate and they call it like product market fit, you know, trying to like make, like, what is my customer, what are they willing to pay for? Um, so we did and, and I think a, a trick that helps is to think of it like an investment so what we did was like, hey, these next three months in 2015 or 2016, we're gonna 100% focus on paid memberships pro. And to do that, every time someone comes to us to build a membership site, we're gonna say, no, we can't do it. Maybe this other company, what the studios, I don't know if they got any clients in that time. <laughs> we were sending them to other agencies. <clears throat> um, and it was like losing money. Like it was like, I'm willing to give you, you know, it was like $20,000, $30,000 a month. So we thought it was like, hey, this is an investment of like $60,000 over the next three months where we'll maintain a couple of clients that you know, were long-term, and we'll focus 100% of our time on paid memberships pro, 
and we'll really try to make it a product and, and do the changes that it needs to grow up. And at that time for us, it was uh, increasing the price um, and then increasing the, you know, I said it was free, but like uh, we had add-ons at that point. So charging for the add-ons was kind of the business model that we saw in fun. We had a bundle to gain access to some of the premium add-ons. And lucky for us, we doubled the price and doubled the number of times our website was saying you have to pay us. And you know the product was good and our network was good that people didn't really blink and they're like, okay. And then revenue on paid memberships pro like quadrupled in that month when we were focused. And we're like, cool, now we're making money on paid memberships pro and we can kind of let the consulting business go and hand off the, the work. Um, so we're gonna get quick and get the questions. Um, but a couple things come up. So getting comfortable, like um, you know, when we were like, hey, we're gonna get in the products, we're like, do we really wanna do this? Cause like consulting was good and like $300,000 a year or we were making that time is like really good middle class, upper middle class money. And that's like, and we, we kind of had the recipe for like niche, we, let's niche down again, double our rates again, work half as much, raise our family. I think we got a dog around this time. It's like focus on the puppy. As I like, do we really want to go into a product where we have tens of thousands of customers? Like, is this what we want to do? Like, cause like you can see the future, like we're going to have to hire people. Um, and so I think it's like that, that's not necessarily easy. It's good to like attack, like actually focus on that and be intentional about the decisions that you're making. Um, and it, we run a good business. We run a good life. We don't work 80 hours a week. So we thought we could do that and, and we were, and you know, we made a decision to go into products. Um, Another thing that comes up, again, I have a whole, actually I do have a whole presentation on this, and if you look on the Paid Memberships Pro site and search for dealing with haters, you'll get like a long uh, blog post that's useful. Um, but man, we went from like 30 customers to 30,000 users and customers, and it's like the scale of that, and I see this with other product people is why I call it out, that like, you, I wasn't ready for it, and other people are not ready for like the amount of hate. But like you wake up, and you check support, and they're like, and you get stuff like this. Like, um, you know, the guy's like, this guy's very upset because we gave him his money back. That's actually one of the pros of products is like in consulting, like the, the relationship's going kind of sour and, um, and you're, but if you're making like a lot, you know, $10,000 from that customer, it's really hard to give it back to them and you, you tend to, and also like the skills of consulting are like go above and beyond, like deliver better value, handle it on like face to face, get on the phone call with them, work it out like people. Uh, you know, remember consulting, so like working with the business to help them figure out what they're actually supposed to be doing. So it's like being a consultant, you know, take, putting that effort in is how you would save the relationship when people are upset. When you have 30,000 users and you're just like, I'm not going to call this guy and tell you know, to get my $97 back or whatever. Uh, so I think I gave him a refund and he was like, he's like, he can't refund me. I was like, yeah, I don't want to work with you, man. You're very, he was this hostile in our support queue. I was like, you're very hostile. Um, yeah, and I, I think I learned not to react as much, just give them their money back and move on. But we got a one-star review. The second one underneath is funny because there's an email and he threatens to like find my house and punch me in my face and my house, <laughs> like, like uh, tear off my face. Yeah, um, you know, my home address is available if you search well enough. Uh, it was like a little scary and I caught, you know, I think I was on the phone with him. And at some point I'm like, wait, we don't have a $30 product. Like, wouldn't you actually buy? I can't find your name in our system. He had bought another membership plugin. <laughs> he couldn't cancel that one. And so he turned around when he realized that. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that I was overreacting. And then he was like, do you know what that plugin is? And like, actually, how does your plugin work? Maybe it's good. And I was like, no, my plugin's not good for you. <laughs> it's, probably, yeah, it's not gonna work. From what I hear, like, it's not gonna work for you. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, like the, they weren't even a customer. So it's like you, you wake up, like, I think Tim Ferriss has like a good presentation about his, his audience is millions of people and he's like yeah. the size of New York City and every day like someone just broke up with their, you know, fiance and someone just lost their job and someone's like literally off their medication <laughs> and people are having bad days and like you, you bear the brunt of it. I'm like, <laughs> man, I get choked up because like, you're like, shit, the reason is like, I'd wake up and see this and then play with my kids. And I'd be like upset. <laughs> anyway, so like, you gotta get ready for this. Read my post. <laughs> um, there's ways to deal with it. And actually I have a good team that helps us. All right, sorry. Uh, so then relaunching. So we had a successful business that's going well. And it's like, one thing to keep in mind is like, uh, you don't just launch and you're done. And even if the launch kind of fails, like I sent the email, like no one bought it. It's like, so no one knows, just launch again. Like, figure out what went wrong, like, send another email to different people or the same people. 
um, you know, they weren't, you know, it's, uh, you don't just get one shot at this. And in reality, like the um, common advice <clears throat> around like pricing in general and how you charge for your business is like every two years. I heard this from um, Marcos Rivera, who's uh, good on pricing. He has good books and content. Uh, it's like every two years you should be changing something about your pricing, but no, like no more than every two quarters, that's too much for your customers. But every two years, like introduce a new plan, raise your prices, change what's offered and which plan, stuff like that. Um, some other good guys on pricing, um, and it is two guys, we should find some uh, female <laughs> folks too. Although Alex Hermazzi is married to Laura Hermazzi, they're like a power duo, and Laura also has lots of good advice, but Alex Hermazzi has a bunch of videos on pricing, and he's pricing like offline, like gym, he has a lot of marketing advice on like getting people to like sign up for a gym membership, and it's like, is that just like an online? And like some stuff overlaps and some stuff doesn't, but it's still good advice. And uh, Patrick Campbell, who uh, ran Profit Well and sold it, uh, focused a lot on pricing and has a lot of good uh, content on pricing. But um, we do too. We do too. Yeah, our website has a bunch. We got some uh, blog posts about pricing for value. And one thing that I don't see a lot is like pricing based on timing. So. One thing on our Paymarsters Pro support plan, it used to be like $19 a month, and then people would sign up, get their answer question, their question answered the first month, and then three months later, be like, why am I paying you? You already answered my question. Can I get a refund for the past two months? And you're like, wow, $20 to answer a question, like it probably wasn't worth it. Um, and then sign up again three months later because they had another question, and like the pace of questions on a WordPress site is not month to month, it's kind of year to year. So like we, most of these product companies, we fall into like annual pricing. Um, there's another good pricing story. I'm gonna get questions though, like, uh, ask me about pricing if you're interested. Uh, but the, the timing of when you deliver value and if the price matches the timing is really good. Um, yeah. And uh, watching again too, like I think I, I still get this where it's like, hey, the main product is free, it's always available, you know, on GitHub, and then they're like, but how do you make money? And are you gonna be in business to like support my site? You know, like, um, so it's kind of, that was a focus during this phase of relaunching and be like, well, no, we're like a you know a big boy business and we make money and we're gonna be around for a while. Um, <laughs> so anyway, quick in summary, like uh, some of the key points, like uh, monetize your free users, make sure you have an email list, uh, focusing on free and open source can help you get that exposure so you're learning more in that early stage. Um, simple pricing is easy. That moment when you have to go in, if you treat it like an... I was considering uh, starting up a a medical membership site like for uh, orthopedic surgeons. Okay. Anything that, that you'd recommend? Orthopedic surgeons, so membership site, and is the idea that they would like talk to each other and be like, or like no, a, like, no, like a kind of like a professional, kind of like a directory sort of, you know, directly, directly, uh, directory. Oh, like, direct, like a directory, so people could find orthopedics. Yeah. And things. But you know, obviously, you know, you yeah. charge orthopedic implant. You know, yeah. Maybe a review site too. Yep. Um, so I, I think that could work. It's like, a, so like look for a membership solution, but also a directory solution. We have like a directory add-on. So if you're just looking for like the terminology of like the software I should look for. Um, I think my listings would be a good place to start. Where? My listings. My listings. Okay. It's a theme, but it also has like custom data, like UI stuff. So you can build out like a custom listing site. I highly recommend it. Yeah. And I think these um, directory sites, where like, and it's kind of like a marketplace, like people who need orthopedics or yeah. finding orthopedics, right. it's a chicken and egg problem, so you have to have control over one of those. Do okay. you already have the audience of people looking for orthopedics? No, so you need to build up traffic then, right? Yeah, that's a, yeah you, got, you, you gotta get one or the other first. So like if you, a bunch of articles and videos about orthopedic type stuff so that you get traffic right. that's interested in that content, and you're like, oh, now I have that traffic, orthopedics want that lead gen. Or some people take it from the, if you happen to be like, I'm an ex orthopedic, my best friend is, I go to the meetings, we all golf together. You know, you could tackle it from the other side, but it sounds like that would work. So focus on the, and that's a general uh, solution for membership sites is, it's better if you like build the audience first. Um, the successful ones like have an audience and then they build a membership. It's kind of like, it's like the, what is it, the field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. It's like, not always. Like in, Sometimes I see it, so I don't like to discourage people too much. You know, it's like 5% of the time it works out, and so like take a stab. <laughs> but it's better if you can build up like an audience, and you're like, now I have an audience that's roughly interested in X. Let me monetize it. membership to the members 
the thousand for why I have the X amount of visitors and so forth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you tell the orthopedic, hey, I got a thousand visits a month and they're potentially gonna need your services. Will you then they'll answer your email and post their stuff on your site and maybe give you money. Yeah, I have a question. I just don't know what the question is exactly. Okay. But I think it's about mindset because you yeah. talked about your timeline in 2004, 2005. You know, uh, I remember those days, um, also finishing university around that time, and I would not have done what you did. Yeah. And I always mm. feel like I'm, like right now, the big thing is you know, AI and things like that. So mm. I always feel like, oh, I'm too late you know, to, to, uh, to kind of go out, go out on my own. So, yeah. Um, so right now, you know, like I, I have a podcast, a website, I have a mailing list, and it's relatively successful. But I don't know what to do with it, and I, I keep like second guessing myself. Yeah, um, people kind of like what I'm doing, but it's all free. I don't get really get paid. It's just content. Right. Um, so how do you get into that mindset of just doing stuff? Yeah. It's a loaded question. I did on some level, like you're kind of born with it. Um, and you're like you're uncomfortable if you're not, you know, building things. Um, but in terms of like feeling like you're too late um, is interesting. Like uh, it, there is there is this kind of like attention on AI in particular now. So if you can get ahead first, you can get the write ups and the attention, and, and there is like value in that, and there's even money involved. But five, 10 years from now, like the solutions and companies are around are the ones like with staying power. So like if you, you know, if you have the, if you're really, you, you don't want to jump on AI because you feel like everyone else is. Like if you, I'm actually really excited about it. We should talk about that too in the hallway. Um, but uh, it, we're trying not to like go too fast with it. Like we're definitely experiment, experimenting with it, but it's really like, what is this tool? Like if, if we use it in a deeper way, it's going to be better going forward um, in my opinion. So. It's, it's tough, like uh, you can feel it too late. Or like when we created a membership plugin, there were two other membership plugins. There's like a hundred membership plugins. You can still create a membership plugin, create a useful website. Like, um, so it's almost, it's a good thing. You're like, it validates the market that there's other people trying to sell the kind of thing that you are. So don't feel like, oh, there's already one of those. There's no room for mine. Like if you have an audience and you have access, they don't have your access. They don't know your users. Um, and, and you might be in the phase of, I have a bunch of, if you have users or like interaction, but I don't know exactly what to do. Yeah. Um, a good resource for that that I always recommend is, um, uh, it's called, right now they just rebranded, it's called Launch for the Win. So it's like, if you search, I think for like launch.ftw, mm -hmm. and it's Alex Hillman and Amy Hoy who have actually done this consulting the products, they probably have their own version of this presentation. And uh, they have a thing called like sales safari, which is like you find your customer base and then like how do you figure out what they're willing to pay for? What are their pain points? It's like I just said it, but they have like a process for like sit down and actually do this and take these kinds of notes and do this analysis. And when they coach people through that process and you can do it on your own too, like you find, it becomes, maybe sometimes it becomes obvious. You're like, oh, this is something I can make that these people can pay for. And, and again, like try it, you know, like launch and launch again and stuff is good, good advice. Um, yeah, I had a question going back to kind of like the consulting and freelance aspect with pricing. Mm -hmm. when, like, how did you guys like find that sweet spot for people that kind of like you charging them? Because like, you know, mm. it's so widespread, like different uh, products that you can sell. So like, how did you find like that specific sweet spot for when you were in that stage? For pricing consulting services mm -hmm. or yeah. um, stuff like that? Yeah, actually, um, man, I just heard a guy, I forget the root of this advice, but some folks say like start with the price and the product comes later. Um, and there's like a lot of truth in that. Like, and I think we were doing that. We were like, we want to make more money. You know, or like, I, I, you know, like I used to build a website for 500 bucks. That doesn't feel tenable to me anymore. I want to build websites for more. So um, and you can't just stop there, yeah. but that's like a good starting point is kind of like, because the, the price points will define a bit about like who the customer is. Um, and Alex Ormazi, who I talked about, has a good video about niching down. So probably if you YouTube Alex Ormazi niche, he talks about like a course. And if you build like a general course on whatever sales, it's like maybe 10 or 100 bucks you can charge. But if it's in like sales and WordPress, you're like, oh, that's more specific to me. 10 to, um, you know, maybe $500. If it's like, here's a course to, you know, pass this sales test. And when people pass this sales test, they can get like a $25,000 raise at their big corporate sales job. And like, oh, well, that course you can charge thousands of dollars for. So 
is this one way to think about it? So like you could consider that. Like think of the price first and go backwards from there. Um, sometimes like makes it clear. Um, I hope that's answering. I know there's a lot involved in pricing yeah, yeah, yeah. like specifics. Just to add to yeah. that, um, one thing I quilt for like as a personal hobby and when people want me to make a quilt for them, I say in my head like what is the minimum I would want to be paid for per hour to get a basic quilt done. And then I kind of up it by like five, ten dollars per hour because I don't know what I'm getting into. And the same goes for building a site. Like I actually am doing a quilting build one and I was like, oh, it's easy. I'll just add you and subscribe to your account. No, I'm in over my head. <laughs> it is so much harder and I'm doing it for free. <laughs> um, but I kind of like up it a little bit. That way, if it's more complicated, I'm still getting at least what I wanted to get paid and a little bit more. And if it ends up being super easy, then it's a great payday. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so you, and I don't know when the official stop time is 12.15, then it's lunch at 12.30, so yeah. I'll keep answering questions till 12.30 if people are around, but I don't know. It's okay, but you, you go ahead and then I'll go oh, back. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you talk for a moment, maybe more particularly towards the beginning when it was a smaller team, yeah. what percentage of your time was spent towards, I, I know at the beginning of the development process, you're going to be developing the plugin, it's almost 100% development, yeah. then you launch the product. How much percentage of the time do you spend on support and like managing the product versus future development? Um, uh, and yeah, now you probably end. have more people yeah. specifically dedicated to supporting, but yeah. in the early days, what 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 time would you say? Yeah. Don't have to be very, very yeah, that's good. Um, Are you spending half your time doing support and then half the other time kind of developing new features, or is it a different balance? Yeah, and that. I don't know if I was that conscious, that feels like a bad balance. Um, and again, I guess some things is like, we were usually underpaid for support, so we yeah. were like motivated not to, um, and, it, and especially because we're also doing consulting, there's like a lot of feedback loops in that where, uh, it, when we initially built it, we had four customers, and we kind of spread the cost of development across them, they were paying us an hourly rate to build it, and then we were spending additional time, and don't do that thing without like being transparent about what you're doing, where you're like, you know, they like, uh, I'm building this for two other people. It was very open to our customers that it was like, hey, this is an opportunity. It, like, it would cost $100,000 to build this, but I got four people, I got $25,000 from each of you kind of a thing. So, so there was, it was really blended, like what was support and what was consulting. Yeah. And, and what, what would generally happen is like the level, but I can't do that for you. But if you buy my do it for me plan, that's exactly what that's for and I'll spend five hours. Or if you, I would, if you hired me for contracting, I would do that for you. And some people get upset. They're like, you're just putting out a broken product so you can charge for support. And you're like, I see how you think that's true. But um, it's an issue. So I don't know if that helps. It's like, it's, there's a lot of feedback loops and it's very blended in that early stage. First, we're consulting. We're like, a lot of the support was, we were act, sometimes we were charging an hourly rate to fix a bug. Cause, yeah. But it also benefited everyone else. I'm more kind of thinking about, yeah. like, say, on mm -hmm. like the WordPress support form, or maybe if you have your yeah. own website support. You're going to be like people are going to be posting it, problems, and that's where like and we put a price tag on it to be like, hey, yeah. you know, whatever. So we and I was like, I encourage people to try this. Like .org, we support it now for free because it's kind of where like the nature of our business is worth spending. Like these probably spend five, ten thousand dollars a month, like paying people to hang out and right. answer questions. Um, and it's, it's worth it for us because we gen leads from that. But it wasn't worth it for us. So we put like a sticky post that right. was like, hey, like yes. I'll answer direct questions or if it's a bug affecting a lot of people. Don't expect it, if it's yeah. your website, you have to come to my website and give me $97 a year right. and then I'll support you. Right, right. And then I was making some enough money to justify the support. Gotcha. Um, and I'm pretty sure like the dot org is still okay with that. If you have a sticky post being honest about the best yeah. way to get support on things. Yeah. And, and so it's like, that is a challenge. You're like, oh, I'm spending so much time support. It's like, put a price tag on it and tell people that they have to pay you. Yeah. And it's like, some people complain. And people are always going to complain. Like, no matter when you charge and how you charge and There's where, yeah. someone complains. You want to make sure that you're not focused on that. I know people. Are, if you want to leave, but I won't be offended. Like, I'm <laughs> um, I'll, I'll get you to. And then you had your hand up. Sure. So, um, I think this was not the first plugin of its kind when you released it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so. Uh, whenever I do a product or show a product to somebody, there's always that inevitable. They, they, they almost frantically scramble to try to tell me that somebody's already doing it. They're like, oh, that's like this, right? And I'm that guy, that, by like, the way. I'm always like, oh, let's just yeah. do this other thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you're just like, you're done. Yeah, so do you down. use, did you okay. like notice early on that you yeah. were using the shortcomings of other membership 
plugins to yeah. sell yours, or you were like solving um, problems they weren't, or you're just saying like we're gonna give you you try to throw something else in to sweeten the deal, like we're gonna give yeah. you more on one support, or we're gonna like be price less, or yeah. like, how did you approach those objections early on? Um, yeah, we definitely thought about that. So like the there's two we thought there was a space for the membership plugin, and we like. We didn't want to use off-the-shelf stuff for our customers, and that's why we thought we could we could build it better ourselves. And it was kind of a, S2 members, I think it's still around, felt complicated. It was a lot of screens, a lot of settings, and it felt like it could be simplified. Wishlist member, which I think just got acquired and is changing hands and changing practices, but at the time, their code was obfuscated, so like you couldn't tweak it. So it wasn't like a WordPress way, it wasn't developer-friendly. Um, so it was like, oh, like a developer-friendly, simple, straightforward membership plugin. Like, um, there was a WooCommerce, but there was other e-commerce plugins, and I originally thought like, oh, membership's just a, a e-commerce product type. But like I said, like the, you don't have inventory, you don't have shipping, you don't have these deals. Like, you have a lot of baggage of like WooCommerce now that you don't need. WooCommerce has a membership and subscriptions plugin. It's actually really good for a lot of use cases, but you know, it could be baggage on the on the right kind of site. So we. Feature-wise, we were like, there's a need for this. And then also kind of like marketing-wise, we chose to be like a free and open source plugin. There was no plugin like that. And that was like our, it's good to have like a, you can make a really good product. And we had this too, like we went to work camps and it's like, oh, memberships, ours is best. It's better than all those. Like you're complaining about this. We actually already saw that. And then a year later, I'd be like, oh, so you're using payments just and I'm still using this other membership plugin. And it's like, dude, you gotta switch because it's awesome. And it takes time for people. Like you could build a better product and no one uses it. But we also had a marketing strategy that was unique where like we were zigging instead of zagging and in our case it was like a free and open source there was no free and open source one so that word at that time we got placement so I've, that's a really short like you know yeah. like kind of marketing product thought of like but it is important to like both like product wise and the marketing wise like i have a plan for why people need my product and i can get their attention and get them to use it i know you had your hand up yes um firstly thank you for the presentation my question is about the early stages where you knew that you wanted to build a product and you knew that there were some gaps in your knowledge. What did you do to fill those gaps where you'd be able to have the skills to be able to build your product? And that's really good question. Um, I feel like that was a lot of the value of like being a freelancer and I say you could skip those steps, but I think it's the product people who start out as freelancers and consultants really like have a leg up over people who are building products from scratch because you get that experience of working with customers and then being put on the spot like do this thing that's never been done before and you're forced to figure that out i'm trying to think specifically and actually this was a, so like the my the advice from 2008 maybe doesn't apply now um to fill the gaps but so i i mean it's like um <clears throat> like take on those challenges um with clients you can be up front so sometimes we were like like, that doesn't exist, I don't know how to do that. I'm gonna spend time trying to figure out how to do that, and sometimes it was build or not build, or partially, or like, I'm gonna charge, you know, I'm not gonna charge you for all that time, like make it clear. So sometimes we have conversations of that, like, I'm not even sure if this is possible. I'm gonna to try to figure it out for you. And sometimes like, depending on the client, they're like, that's cool, you're a consultant, I pay you to do that. And sometimes it's kind of like, don't worry, I'm not charging you for that. So like, we do that to, um, because I, I do think like, trying to solve real problems for real customers and consultants, like you usually end up at, this, it's more, you're more likely to end up at the solution than if you kind of seek out problems on your own. Um, so that might help, I think. But if you're thinking of like sources, oh, like finding, a, so these work camps are great and finding people who are in a similar boat um, and people that you can talk shop with, like that's hugely invaluable of, um, you know, that. Uh, you know, with the skill sets that you need that you can talk and be like, hey, how do you do this? How do you run into this? How do you do that? Um, look out for mentors. There's a cool concept of like, a, like an invisible mentor or a shadow mentor. <laughs> I'm not like inviting people to do this to me necessarily, but you could. But like, sometimes you're like, I feel like that person knows what I don't know. And maybe I'm too shy or I don't actually have the connection to like literally reach out and ask some questions. But you could just like pretend they were your mentor. And sometimes, like, if you follow them, like, even just mentally, like, know what they would what they would recommend because you know them. If you listen to a podcast in particular, like, you know people. Um, but then, like, reach out as if you know. If don't feel actually like don't. I said like, hey, maybe you're nervous to reach out. Try to get over that because a ton of people who have done things that you're trying to do are like really happy to share when people are nice and enthusiastic and open open about it. So, reach out and ask questions and things. Does that kind of help? 
Okay. Yeah. It's 1222. Just good. Sure. Um, I know you said um, when you were building the plugin, um, the membership plugin, you had people um, already, like customers basically, that were yeah. funding it. Consultant. Yeah. Um, Consultant. And I don't remember if you said, like, did you, when you started at first, were you trying to solve a problem that you had or yourself, or were you already huh. like trying yeah. to build it for <clears throat> other people in the beginning? We were. Yeah, our first motivation was to build it for other people. So we had built e-commerce websites, um, and there's an interesting story you can tell me that uh, I can tell about. Like, we built e-commerce for like four people, and it was awesome, fully featured. But like, only those four customers knew about it. And WP Commerce at the time, open source free products got exposure in WordPress and made big companies and made a lot of money. So I was like, ooh, like next time I have this product, I'm gonna try to like build it openly. Um, but then we were doing a lot of e-commerce, but people needed like membership, recurring subscriptions was challenging, and like uh, and also like I said, the known inventory, and restricting content was unique. So they had that need, and the existing software was overly complicated to integrate into a couple like really custom websites. Like the first couple clients were like uh, someone who had artists upload content. It was like a directory, and they you know it was a marketplace to match with galleries, and the other one had like a kind of a SaaS learning platform with tons of customization. So it's kind of hard to bolt on these other plugins anyway. So it's like, I'll have to build it. Um, so we were scratching the itch for on behalf of our clients. We actually ended up using our own software to sell it, which was cool. And I do think, I call this dog fooding. Someone has a better name for it, like drink your own champagne. <laughs> but I find that's really valuable. And we do it on purpose all the time where it's like, like let's make a course and sell a course because then our core software, we're using it because otherwise we don't, as much as we talk with customers, you don't really know until you use it. And sometimes I find bugs and it's kind of like, how did no one notice? Like I started using one of our features and it doesn't work. I was like, no one noticed that this thing just doesn't what you say do this and it doesn't do that. Like it didn't come up in support. And then you're usually like, it did, but like you were busy and you didn't, I was like, okay, you're right. Um, so anyway, it is, if you can, I, so I didn't start there, but it is good to be there if you can, like kind of even super I have, I have a couple yeah. of plugins that I've written to solve internal problems. Yeah. Like, and there's, because nothing existed. Had two to five times like, the effort to get other people to use it. So I think you, would you start like like a like a beta test type thing where somebody has it for free and yeah and it, iron out all the bugs and stuff. Yeah, and, and there's, there's other ways. Like that's why like free is important because you can put it out kind of half baked mm -hmm. and be like you always have that option of like listen, I know it's free, take it or leave it. Right. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. you put a price tag on it, now you're like locked into a contract kind of to deliver like certain value so basically let it mature like a free product and yeah so yeah so delaying charging for it uh can help with that and you don't have to be worried about that like um if it is like a wordpress open like it's open source gpl there's going to be it's going to be available yeah. somehow legally people can copy it and use it so we i've always felt like embrace that and like that's part of the nature and try to sell stuff on top of it and we have people who come to our website and give us 300 dollars for something they could download somewhere for free um, so like, it, like the real customers and people who won't pay are going to go above, you know, the, so I think don't be scared of free as an option. And the other thing to think about, like when we were like pricing at low, but below value consciously was I always had in mind, like I'm focused on the thousands of customers I'm going to get in the future rather than extracting as much value as possible from like the 10 or hundred people using it now. So that helped me feel good about giving away for free or cheap cap baked. Um, and then, like you said, you test the waters and like, is there a market for this? And we, we do this now with add-ons where it's um, like, as, some, as soon as something's useful, put it out there and get feedback. So it's like, it's not even a feature, it's just a blog post on how to do this on your own, like how to integrate with this thing through Zapier or some other way. And then it's like, ooh, that blog post is getting a lot of information. And then it's like, well, here's a slightly easier way to do it. It's a code gist that you can copy and paste. And like, oh, the code gist is popular. And it's like, okay, here's a plugin with like some basic UI to make it easier to do. And like, that's getting, and it's like, okay, now let's build it into like a full-fledged product. And so we, we, we've always kind of, you know, tested things that way too. Thanks. Yeah. Cool, thanks everyone. Let's go. Cool. Thanks.